Adding to the ever-growing variances of dialogue topics touched upon this series, I want to turn to Astro City as an example of classic narration boxes. How they interact and engage with the imagery on the page, both thematically, temporally, and through that hopefully a little bit about what that says about comics as a medium as well. Quick reminder before we start this episode that the latest issue of the Eisner Award winning Panel by Panel magazine is available right now. You've got a 2019 year in review issue which features an interview with Daniel Warren Johnson, essays on our favourite comics of the year and much 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 more. Plus we've got a web comics issue coming out at the end of January so you can find that at panelxpanel.com. Anyway, you're watching Strip Panel Naked, I'm Hass and I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff lurking in the pages of some of the best comics. So firstly, let's just quickly define what these narration boxes are. So they're what you might typically see in a modern superhero comic, so internal narration and monologues from the character involved in the scene. There's different ways you can approach this, you can kind of do like second person narration, third person narration too, but primarily in mainstream comics you'll almost exclusively find this to be first person narration. As such, first person narration seems to have been the dominant replacement for the thought balloon, a way inside the character's minds on the page. And I would argue that this is actually quite a literary tendency, as writers become more and more dominant in the comics medium in terms of crafting the beats of the story on the page in the full script, we have started to see more and more narrative tendencies from fiction and other forms too, primarily that of film and prose, bleed into comics. Now in this instance we're kind of thinking about prose, as often this sort of first person narration is a very prosaic element. Films have it too, the, you know, the ubiquitous use of voiceover in narrative films was definitely a way to easily create some of the inner struggle and tension that prose novels have got much easier access to. It's also why Robert McKee in Story argues it's a cheap way out, right? It means you don't have to kind of do the work in the visuals on screen, instead your character can just very directly tell you how they're feeling and what they're thinking. I should leave here right now. I'll start over. I need to face this project head on and- And God help you if you use voiceover in your work, my friends. God help you. However, in comics, it also becomes a spatial concern, because you've only got 20 or so pages in these modern mainstream superhero comics, and writers wanted a way into the characters that doesn't necessarily require visuals, so that you can move action along at the same time. And that brings us to our first point, really, which is the duality of narration and visual action. And this is something that's entirely comics, right? Because prose can't do this. It has to choose between one or the other at any single moment, because in essence, you're reading a single stream of text. So if you want to do action or monologuing, you have to choose one and then the other and then the other. Film can show you both visual and it can give you an oral output of voiceover, and so can comics, but the big difference I think between these two things is that when it comes to film, what you're listening to is someone's actual voice, which therefore becomes less prosaic and more dialogue focused. We'll get into this with comics and how that's different in a moment, but let's just take a look at this second page of the first issue of Astro City to get an idea of how it works on the page. And it has this Superman-like naked character flying in the sky. We see three narrative caption boxes, but we also have the visuals at the same time. So both are there existing at once, and as we read the narration, we're already aware of the visuals. You know, it's still somewhat linear, but it means that both are still interacting with each other, and that's incredibly potent and powerful as a storytelling tool. And if you do look at this page without the captions, you already get a sense of what it's presenting. There's a kind of really good body language wonderfully rendered by Brent Anderson in a very superheroic style. And what this page does is show someone freely flying through the clouds. What we don't get, however, is specificity. The captions explain more. They mention how the character soars unfettered and how he loses himself in the sun and the sky. And through the visuals, you know, we get the sense of that, but we don't get that level of specificity. A few pages later, you can see how that specificity becomes incredibly useful as a narrative tool. The character starts putting on their cape and costume, and the narration tells us they're hearing about a weather issue in the Philippines, and a little bit of background detail that, you know, this sort of thing kind of happens a lot and it's clearly somewhat stressful to this character. And it is a specificity, which is going to be the key word for this episode, that doesn't exist within the art. The art tells us about the character's hurried movements, their superhuman physique, the costume, a sense of where they live in this kind of city metropolis, all things which the captions neglect to discuss. So between the two, they come to give a more rounded sense of what's happening, both internally and externally. It does, however, mean that what we learn is often more concrete than it would be purely visually, which means that, as a reader, we're required to work less things out. You know, in everything that we learn through the art, we've been asked to get there ourselves, and in that sense we can create our own specific bond with them and with the work. What we get from the captions is much more direct communication. You know, it's more specifically kind of being told a story, which requires less direct engagement from us, but it does bring us again to another interesting facet of narration. Because you can use it to dictate engagement with contrast. 
There's a sequence later on in this first issue of Astro City that has our character here, Samaritan, receiving an award, smiling, holding it up, looking pretty chuffed with himself. That gives us one picture of a typical hero and it tells us a story visually. However, the narration also tells us the other side of it, which is his actual feelings on the proceedings. It's a very, very simple usage, right? Just creating that difference between what's written and what's drawn. But it begins to show you some of the narration that can be used in conjunction with visuals. There's loads that have been written about Moore and Gibbons doing this in Watchmen, if you want some further examples. But as a primer and as a very, very simple explanation of how to do this, this sequence in Astro City shows you very, very directly what you can do with an inner monologue running alongside an external visual scene. It also shows you another variable of the narrative caption, which is the way it's actually written, how language is constructed within those. Narrative captions differ from thought balloons in one very, very crucial way, which is why the argument I made earlier that thought balloons and narrations are kind of the same thing isn't quite right. Thought balloons, much like dialogue balloons and sound effects, take place directly within the scene, right? They exist within the image of the panel that you're seeing. The thought balloon is attributed to a character who is directly thinking it in the very moment we're seeing it in that image and in that panel. It means it has a temporal quality applied to it. It exists within the amount of time that the panel is depicting. And it's also much more directly the words of the character in the scene, right? Which means it functions in a more similar way to a dialogue balloon for a character. Now, narrative captions do not have any of those same qualities. They exist as a non-diegetic sound, right? They exist away from the scene, away from the time contained within a panel, on top of a panel almost, rather than within it. You can, for example, have a whole slew of first-person narrative captions in one panel, but it will not change the amount of time or action that the panel itself is supposed to represent. However, if you filled that same panel with the same amount of thought balloons, suddenly what the image is presenting is completely crushed by the amount of time the dialogue balloons are also attempting to convey. Which then changes the way that you can think about language construction in these narrative captions. Because for me, dialogue in a scene wants to be more performative than it is prosaic. What dialogue balloons would hope to capture is the way someone speaks. Narrative captions exist away from that, and so they can become something much more akin to what their inspirations likely are, which is prose. In the case of Astro City, what we're reading is Samaritan telling a story. You can see it in the way he talks about the women that he never gets the chance to meet. There's a narrative being written, bouncing against the art, sure, but far more in the realm of the first person novel format than of actual spoken dialogue. Consider the second issue of Astro City, which doesn't use narrative captions, but instead uses dialogue captions as someone tells a story away from the imagery on the page. Because of that, the language is much more conversational and based around someone actually speaking, and again, there is now a temporal element applied to this, and it reads like dialogue, not like narration. And it ties up what the use of narrative captions can be, because they are a tool of comics that seem far more steeped in prose than any other element, and which allows them to emulate more of the characteristics of novelistic narration than that of naturalistic dialogue. And they exist outside of any temporal elements that constrain what would appear within the panel. The way it can bounce against the visual then is almost unparalleled in terms of tools, because of its unique place as something entirely removed from any moment of visuals within the world. Narrative captions get such a bad rap as a shorthand for content, because it can often be seen as, to quote Brian Cox's McKee in Adaptation, It's flaccid, sloppy writing. Any idiot can write voiceover narration to explain the thoughts of a character. Okay, that's it. One hour for lunch. However, when it comes to comics, I do genuinely think it's a lot more nuanced than that. And actually, much like thought balloons, narrative captions hold a very, very interesting and specific place in the medium, with their own entirely special set of ways that they can communicate and collaborate with other elements of the comic form. To look at narration as just a shorthand for getting more content into the comic is to miss the opportunities that this specific tool can offer you in figuring out ways of telling interesting, unique stories in the comic medium. Thanks for watching. If you're a fan of Strip Panel Naked, you can support the series on Patreon, where you can get access to three years of exclusive writing and annotations. You can also get the Eisner winning magazine I edit at panelxpanel.com and follow me on Twitter at HassanOE. Finally, hit subscribe and that notification bell to keep up to date with all the latest episodes, and I will see you next time.